we may now invite uh, the next uh, respondent, <laughs> and uh, that is Dr. Minal Kasarikar. She will be responding to the presentation by Professor Bhagchandra Jain on uh, chain concept of uh, mind. All the learned scholars on the dais of the dais. At the outset, I thank uh, Professor Gokhale for inviting me here to be part of this uh, very uh, scholarly event. And now I uh, make some points about Dr. Bhakchan Jain's paper on Jainism, uh, Mind in Jainism. Uh, let me first admit that the paper was very comprehensive and was bringing about all the dimensions of mind in Jainism. So firstly, he mentioned about various names that are uh, mentioned in Jainism for mind, like Anindriya, Manas, and Antakkarana, and uh, showing it uh, difference between the sense organs and the mind. I, because there was a lot of discussion about uh, translation and hermeneutical thing, I'm not going into that problem. So let us take mind as manas. So this mind uh, is regarded as the means of knowledge and uh, it is regarded to be independent, it is regarded to be dependent upon the sense organs in the activity of uh, knowledge. Very important distinction that Jainism makes, as Dr. Jain told us, is between the physical mind and the psychical mind, dravya mana and bhava mana. In this distinction, dravya mana comes very close to uh, uh, the sense organs and participates in the activities of sense organs. But the bhava mana, that is the chetana mana, is regarded as the power of activity of the self to perform mental functions. This has very serious ramification in solving the problem of dualism, which actually does not occur in Jainism. Now it is very typical of Jainism that every action or event is connected to the law of karma, and similarly all the mental activities are connected to the destruction come subsidence of some or other kinds of karma. The qualities such as pleasure, pain, etc. are regarded as those of embodied existence of soul, so the mind comes in picture only in the embodied existence of soul. So I think very directly or indirectly, Jainism uh, responds to this problem of the relation between or the need of different entities like soul and mind and uh, maybe brain also. While explaining the relation between the soul and the body, uh, the example of electricity and the bulb is quoted. However, the examples work only in the figurative manner and not in descriptive or literal sense. Otherwise, it may create uh, some kind of serious problem. A lot of discussion can take place over the cognitive role of mind uh, as the varieties and sub-varieties of knowledge accepted in the Jainic tradition uh, are mentioned. Various classifications of instincts uh, were quoted at the ending part of the paper, which are traditionally narrated as the functions of mind. So the paper tries to present the nature of mind and its functions mainly from metaphysical perspective, which is the dominant perspective in the Jaina scriptures and the other philosophical texts too. This can be used as the springboard for going ahead with some discussion related to the nature and function of mind and it would be interesting to throw light on the psychological, epistemological and logical dimensions of mind. So the psychological perspective may show the connection between the mind, passions and uh, here we can also discuss the concept of Lesha in Jainism. The epistemological perspective may throw light on the types of knowledge namely uh, memory and recognition, where mind plays predominant role, not only as the subsidiary to sense organs, but the predominant role. 
and the logical dimension may explore the relation between the consciousness and body where the notion of psychical mind works as the mediator between the two and reduces the age of dualism as we were discussing the dualism that is there in sankhya or the cartesian dualism face the problem of showing the connection between the two uh, entities which are regarded as ultimate entities but jainism in spite of its dualistic and pluralistic approach doesn't see this problem because there are some mediating concepts evolved in order to show the connections uh, so thank you very much thank you dr katanikar uh, so far we have been emphasizing the cognitive aspect of uh, functioning of mind but uh, two other aspects are equally important that is the affective and the cognitive uh, so while referring to the psychological and this yes. etc you have yes. brought in the affective part of it but uh, cognitive is equally important and uh, in jain tradition for chetna another word is used that is upayoga upayoga means uh, consciousness in action so the activity part of consciousness is also equally important and uh, we should uh, take that also into cognizance that's my now the paper is uh, you want to respond you don't want to then so uh, thanks for observation this is simply observation there is no question i i think uh, need not reply anything yes it's okay hello oh. hi thank you all very much professors um my question relates to the nature of consciousness um so throughout the day we've been talking about consciousness um as both a state um that a sentient being um can exist in or as a thing uh, you professor referred to uh, the essence of consciousness um so i was wondering if you could explain in a little bit more detail um if consciousness is indeed uh, a thing um then where does it reside in the context of um the body spirit and mind uh, is it a distinct thing or is it um the coalition of the three um and if it's a state is a uh, an ahmat or a soul able to exist without consciousness because in order for something to be a state i would assume that it might not be inherent and if it is inherent to an ahmat then why are we talking so much about a consciousness if it's merely simply a part of something that we've already discussed um so that's my question thank you all uh, we generally make a distinction between consciousness of of an object what would be the object we also talk of consciousness by means uh, some agent which is the soul and manas will be the instrument and consciousness for which means uh, some objective so objective could be some activity or some ideal to be uh, realized so consciousness therefore is uh, of a multiple nature in its uh, functioning in response to your question uh, i need to uh, point out i would like to point out that the indian philosophers across the systems i'm speaking across the systems they have dealt with the problem of creature both creature consciousness and state consciousness as these terms are understood now uh, in philosophy of mind or in the philosophy of cognitive science and uh, they also dealt with the problems of phenomenal consciousness and intentional consciousness and also first level consciousness and higher order consciousness all these problems have been dealt with in various ways by various schools for instance the nao school says that uh, the self is a physical uh, is uh, an unconscious object it's a jorodrobyo <coughs> where it's a general view no doubt about that but gano sukho gano means cognition sukho pleasure dukho pain uh, um, rago desire aversion <coughs> desho and 
Swayatna uh, volition, they all arise in the self and they also go out of existence. So when the self is liberated, the self will become unconscious <coughs> on the naive view. But the Advaita Vedantins, they identify the reality with pure consciousness and they say that pure consciousness only has reality, has being. The Shankho philosophers, the Diogo philosophers, they admit many conscious principles, call them Purushas. <coughs> so in a way, the Advaitins, the Sankhyos, the Yogos, they are admitting, they are addressing the problem of creature consciousness. And they are trying to solve the problem of state consciousness uh, through the transformation of the mind and as consciousness reflected in the uh, transformation of the mind. Okay. Um, can I? Um, uh, yeah, I want to. I, I have. I have to. Uh, okay. So I have very brief question to Professor, Professor Bhagchandra Jayanji. Uh, according to Jain um, uh, philosophy, uh, the nature of soul is consciousness, jiva, jnana swarupa jiva. So, co um, soul is conscious in that way. And you are also talking about conscious mind and material mind. So, it appears to be a ridiculous task, ridicul ridiculous way. Because you are talking about one conscious soul another conscious mind, another material mind. So what, what is it? And body is there in addition to that. <laughs> the nature of mind is two types. One is Chetan, another is Achetan, Pauzalek. So this Chetan mind, it assists to, to soul for acquiring knowledge. And uh, uh, by dint of this Paudgalic man. So both are, uh, uh, I should say, both are associated with uh, soul. So there is no contradiction. Madam Barman. So, so, soul has no size. Yes, soul has no size. Soul. Yeah, it can have the size of elephant. It can have the size of an yes, ant. Sir, so, is, in that yes. way, I don't think that there is any need of conscious mind. You can give up the idea of conscious yes. mind and can do very well. Conscious mind, that is a part of a soul. <laughs> no, no, yes. no, no, no. Can I? Uh, well, I can, think that I, is. is, like is. <laughs> Uh, in Jain tradition, we have a concept of a Jiva and Ajiva. Jiva stands for self which is conscious and which has in its pure form infinite consciousness. We call yeah. it Ananta Jnana. Yeah. Now, the self becomes conscious of itself and also of objects. Therefore, we say so for uh, our bhasi. It is self-conscious as well as conscious of uh, objects. But this happens only through the mediation of mind. And uh, so the mind, therefore, uh, has to be partly conscious, to be conscious of. Of course, that is a borrowed consciousness, you can say, but it has to be conscious. But, but that uh, conscious mind has some substratum. Borrowed means a. Borrowed is a figurative expression. Figurative. Can I, um, means a, a reflected one. Reflected. Can I, uh, can I ask a question? Uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Uh, so, um, but that uh, conscious uh, mind needs a substratum in a body. And therefore, uh, physical mind is also postulated. This is a postulation. Yeah. So um, I'm intrigued by the suggestion that uh, there is something unique in the Jain conception of mind that somehow 
bypasses the whole question of duality, mind-body duality. And uh, so far, listening to your presentation, I don't see it, how it's done, other than the introduction of a new idea that mind is now, manas is now split into two. One is physical, and the other one is psychical. But is this physical manas that is now doing the mediating role so that there is no dualism? You know, I, I, I didn't quite get it. So can you explain that bit further? Yeah. Why, particularly in the Jain tradition, Jain philosophy, that there is something in it that bypasses the whole duality question? That isn't clear. Um, yeah, we start with that concept of dualism first. So there is a dualism of jiva and uh, sharira. That means uh, the soul and the body. Soul, uh, it's pure consciousness, but maybe as per Jainism, it, it is right from that time immemorial. It is associated with uh, the karma. And karma, according to Jainism, as different again, it's a uh, uh, matter. Soul idea, that, that I understand, yeah, but fine. I'm thinking so of this mind-body. here, mind here body. only yeah. comes that when the soul acquires the body and the sense organs, how does it function? How does soul function through the body? Or how does it make the body function according to maybe its will or something like this? Because everything else except soul is matter. And this is something which is a problem of dualism. That there is no connection, there is no connectivity between the two. Uh, pure consciousness cannot affect pure matter, and pure matter cannot affect pure consciousness. So here, uh, maybe to solve this kind of problem, they talk about these two dimensions of mind, um, where physical mind functions as the sixth sense organ, mm, or sixth organ rather, not sense organ, but sixth organ, which is the organ for knowing your emotions and uh, maybe coordinating in the knowledge process. But the other dimension of mind, which is quasi-material, you can say. It's not purely conscious. It cannot be conscious because it is the product of matter. But it is quasi-conscious uh, or quasi-psychical. And in uh, the looking at the Jaina temperament, they don't leave any edges so sharp. So everywhere, if there is any strict kind of dualism or uh, separation between the two, they will introduce some such thing uh, to reconcile that uh, disparity. That is how uh, I'm suggesting that the concept of psychical mind can function as something like bypassing the problem of dualism. It may or it may not, that means it is a matter of uh, the discussion for the scholars, but this is a suggestion or this is the observation on the concept of mind. No doubt uh, a dualism of uh, consciousness and matter is entertained in Jain tradition in the form of jiva and ajiva. It is at the same time overcome by saying that uh, Jeev and Ajeev come in contact and uh, the result is uh, that uh, the Jeev is affected by the contact of uh, Ajeev. Consciousness gets uh, affected, which means uh, consciousness gets activated. Ajeev to be affected means to get activated. And when it gets activated, then uh, its uh, outcome would be either cognitive or affective or cognitive. These are the three possible ways of uh, consciousness in action. So they do believe that consciousness is in action also. There can be pure consciousness, but there can also be consciousness in action. Any other question? There is from a question. the audience or from the... There is a question. Uh, yeah, please. Hello, thank you very much for uh, receiving my question. Um, 
we've been talking a lot about consciousness and the various aspects of it and what makes that up. And you know, uh, one particular in subject that interests me is the concept of Atman versus Anatman, or self and no self. Um, to sort of differentiate with a metaphor, Atman is sort of like if you have a, a soup and you add some spice to it. The Atman view is that it still essentially is the same. Uh, whereas the on Atman view is since it is changing, it is now something completely different. Um, my question is, what about a, a sort of a possible middle ground where you have, it is still fundamentally the same, but it is also somewhat different in the sense that it is both the same and different at the same time. Thank you very much. I didn't present any papers. See, uh, please see that some uh, this question has been debated over in quite detail between Professor Shachidananda Mishra and Dr. Kuntala Bhattacharya. Now, uh, about change, about transformation, I would like to just add one observation that. Uh, some people, some philosophers, some systems, they adhere to the principle agama paina dharma vi karoti hi dharminam. That is the changing characteristic, they change the substratum. Professor Mishra said, I am once again going back to that, that the concept of change is alien to Anuyaiko, which is a very important observation, I think. This is the Advaita perspective that the accidental properties, they would change its own locus, its own substratum. Dr. Bhattacharya would say that if it changes, perhaps would say that if the accidental properties change its own locus, then why don't you subscribe uh, to Shkhanabhangabhadu, to the doctrine of momentariness. Now what exactly is the point at issue here? The point at issue here is, uh, do you really um, uh, adhere to this principle or not? That uh, uh, something is arising, some state or some property is arising in a locus going out of existence. Then will it change the locus or not? Uh, this is a very oversimplified statement of the problem. There are other problems involved. Whether this state is identical with the substratum or it is absolutely different from the substratum. The problem with the Nunyaikos is that for them, the property and the substem, substance are otyanto bhinno. They are absolutely different. So how can they say that the coming and going properties, that would uh, change the substance? So how can an Arambhavadin talk of Purinamo? They don't use the word Purinamo. Purinamo is the word, Sanskrit word, which comes very close to the English word change. These philosophers didn't know the word change, and uh, the Advaitins believe that it will change the substratum. So they say that all changing properties are not as real as the locus. The Buddhists, they identify the dharma, uh, they don't uh, admit any dharmin, any avayavin, over and above the dharma or the avayavos. So they say that everything is momentary. The dharmas are momentary, so that is the philosophy of change. This is the philosophy, uh, the Advaita is the philosophy of identity. There are philosophies of identity in difference. Noyaiko is the now is the philosophy of absolute difference. In the Nyaya system, a, an effect is uh, a result of a causal complex. And in causal complex, uh, you have uh, samavai karana, asamavai karana, and a nimitta karana. So far as uh, samavai karana is concerned, it continues to exist in the effect. So uh, the stuff out of which it is made continues to be in a changed form, not in the same form, but in a changed form. Say for example, uh, milk uh, continues to exist in curd, but not in the same form, but in a changed form. So, essence of milk is continuing, 
At the same time, it is changing. Therefore, Nayaika should uh, admit a change also. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sir, sir, this is sir, an, one minute. Uh, let me explain the point uh, the parin let me explain the, this example from nyaya point of view the example of curd and milk as nyayika explain it that when you put a curd in a glass of milk the milk gets destroyed only atoms are left and from those atoms in those atoms there is pak pak means vilakshana teja sanjo conjunction of heat a special kind of heat and thereafter those qualities are getting produced in those atoms uh, which are present in curd and thereafter those atoms get conjoined to form dvainuka from dvainuka to trasrenu and from so on uh, the curd is getting produced and this is a new creation no kind of change no, no, is accepted no. See, by the you get curd only out of milk you don't get curd out of water what does it mean it means that uh, the element of uh, milk uh, continues to exist in curd otherwise uh, curd could have been produced out of anything sir, and everything sir there is not nothing it. left in curd which is which should be called milk the properties are getting changed every everything is getting changed and if you take the example of this famous example which nayika accept when you produce cloth a piece of cloth from threads That's so threads it. are there when cloth is produced but in that case too threads are not getting destroyed or threads are not uh, uh, transformed into cloth cloth is a re real entity a different entity and threads are different entities so these two we, we can borrow the terminology of the advaitins you can say there is only change of nama and uh, roop uh, <laughs> thread, uh, it will go against the realism <laughs> it will go against the realism and common notion common sense so the locus of consciousness so the philosophers okay so the point is that uh, the, the ans to answer to this question would be supplied by differently by different philosophers a uh, uh, um, philosopher like charvak philosophers would say that the locus of cognition is the body and in this body itself you can assign a place where this cognition uh, is, resides and if you ask this question to nayika he would say that this cognition is present in atman and again it could be located somewhere because if you are if you cut the hand they, he remembers very well and if you cut the uh, legs uh, the person remembers very well so in that case too you can say that this is the locus of but it must be remembered that the substratum of cognition is something different from the locus of cognition this is called sharira vachhedena atmayo adhikarana the atman is the substratum of cognition but in this body itself not outside the body the cog the substratum of cognition is not outside of the body so in this will be the same answer i think by uh, jain philosophers too and yep. if the question is asked by to a buddhist philosophers he would say that there is no need of any substratum at all there is no need of any locus at all but in nowhere there is any cognition the cognitions can stand without any substratum dharma dharmi bhav is not accepted in buddhist philosophy and this is question regarding dharma dharmi bhav yes i am just asking how can you distinguish between a substratum and a locus uh, can you please specify uh, okay how to distinguish it in nyaya philosophy okay because in nyaya philosophy nayayika say uh, they have uh, made a very clear relation avachhedakata <laughs> sambandh because this um, i have told you that atman is all pervasive it is omnipresent 
conjoined with everything in motion. But my, I, am, I am conscious about those happiness, those pleasure, those pains which are produced in my body. I am not conscious about uh, the pains which are produced in other bodies. Therefore, my, I, this is the locus. This is the locus. And uh, uh, the substratum is um, Atma. Because I put forward the arguments why this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was the point. That was the point. Thank you. Thank you for correction. Uh, okay, but uh, you feel all over the body. Yeah, but that is the point that what is the locus of that body when you, c the example you remember, please. Uh, if you cut your legs, you remember very well. But if something happens to your mind. Giving it there. No? Yeah. Giving it there. Giving it that is the awesome. Friends, the time is up. And uh, for discussion, there is no end. And uh, we may continue to have discussion uh, over the break also. Now I think uh, some no, announcements. Yes.